before we get started, uh, tell me a little bit about your background in, in EMS. Um, and uh, yeah, do either of you have experience in the healthcare industry? You want to go first, Sam? Yeah, I, I um, was certified as an EMT uh, back in the mid 80s. Uh, also, was certified as American Heart Association CPR instructor, which I've been teaching for over 30 years now. And I've maintained those certifications. Uh, but, all, you know, I only worked on the AMOS about seven years, two hospital based uh, not for profit services. Um, but I like to say what brings me to this issue is I'm a parent and I'm a concerned citizen, basically. Uh, I started as an EMT way back in 1975. Um, I was interested in the program and I took the course and thought, well, this is kind of good stuff to know. If I never use it, at least I know general first aid. Then when I wound up in Athens, I applied to St. Mary's and started there in the summer of 76. While I was going to EGA, it was a great part-time job for, for school. And uh, once I graduated from Georgia, I decided to um, proceed further with education because there's a basic EMT level. Then it was just a basic EMT level, uh, cardiac technician level, and then a paramedic level. So I went ahead and did the paramedic level. And came back and started working at Saints um, in 1980 full-time. And... Uh, was there for 33 years until National took over in 2012. Um, no, 2009. Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, I, I, let's back a little bit. Uh, tell me your names also. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's important. Yeah. Uh, Sam Raffle. And Bob Gadd. Um, and you, you said you, uh, you you stopped working at um, St. Mary's? When well, just, yeah, just when they, the both hospitals got together and decided that we were um, losing too much money. I was told off off the record by an administrator that we we're picking up too many poor people, so that's when they started to outsource, looking for other services to outsource to to take over the EMS. Because back then, Athens Regional had a hospital based EMS, as did St. Mary's, and back in the late seventies, they actually divided the the county up into zones. They had a central dispatch center. That was trying to coordinate the closest ambulance to get to the emergency. So it was um, it was like that for years and years. And then um, they came up with the number of a million dollars each per year that we were losing. Each service was losing. Each ambulance service. Correct. Yeah. That number was never verified. It just kind of like they just. And, well, Andy here had actually asked for an audit. He did, uh, didn't at he? At the yeah. time and was denied. Yeah. I think by the city manager at the time. Um I don't, yeah, so those numbers were never verified. I think for whatever reason, they were ready to get rid of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, maybe there are a lot of people who don't have insurance in this state. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, that's why 911 is not profitable. So, so March public 1st, service, public safety. But. March 1st of 09, I was, I worked my shift at St. Mary's and wanting to stay in Athens as a medic because I knew the hospitals, knew the, you know, knew the people. Um, I just transitioned to, to national, um, and that was in '09, and I was there for three years with them. And so, so you were at St. Mary's driving an ambulance as a paramedic for Correct. thirty years. You said thirty-three, yeah, thirty-three years. Yeah, and, and you you left when national took over. Not by choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they just decided to do away with it. I mean, one minute they were there, and the next minute they were they dissolved the department. Oh wow. So, um, and you know it was. No, no one wanted it, but we knew it was going to happen. Um, and there were some issues with that. They were looking at different companies to take it, and National got the, the bid for it. And um, as you saw in the presentation the other night, they were had glowing um, you know, awards and all this kind of stuff to make them feel like they were a good, you know, good choice. Did you feel uneasy at the time um, that a, a for-profit... Oh, yeah, yeah. It not as, we knew National, the reputation they had way back before they took over was that they had good equipment on their ambulances, but they had lousy pay. And so what I experienced was um, the equipment was fair. I mean, it wasn't exceptional. And did, I did take quite a bit of a pay cut to work for them, working the same shift. Yeah. I, I had concerns at the time, and I wrote letters to the editor and letters to the mayor and commission expressing a concern about turning this aspect of public safety over to a for-profit provider. Mm -hmm. 
And if I knew now <laughs> what I didn't know then, so right. to speak, uh, I would have been even more adamant because um, we have lacked transparency and most of what I feared has come to fruition and it's been way worse than I anticipated. What I discovered working there um, pretty quickly is that the quote I had to describe it was that they put profit over patient care by having their ambulances take off um, to run non-emergency transport. So they have a fleet of a certain amount per day, say a half dozen trucks or eight to ten trucks, whatever, ambulances. And they would just use an unlimited amount of those ambulances to run non-emergency transports. And so those would involve both local transports, say from the hospital back to a nursing home, or all the way to Augusta, to Atlanta. We we're just all over northeast Georgia Wait, so taking so folks. Wait, so they, they use ambulances? So every ambulance that you see, they're responsible for 911 calls, like you would expect an ambulance would be, but also they're doing non-emergency transports. Like, can you give an example of uh, just taking, say, a patient back, um, maybe they had an illness and they're in the hospital for pneumonia or maybe a fractured hip or whatever, and they may have been non-ambulatory, unable to walk, and they would require a stretcher to, to get them home. So it'd be just, you don't do anything, it's just a transfer to another facility. Yeah, these, these patients no longer even need the hospital, so right. it's, it's not emergent, it's not 911. There's probably half a dozen other non-emergency companies in Athens that could run that same call. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the goal of a for-profit company is to make money. That's right. not saying yeah. anything bad about the company. But the way National EMS, a for-profit ambulance company, makes money is by running non-emergency, non-911 transports. But we also gave them the 911 contract, and they do not separate those two things out. And that's what we call playing Russian roulette with the community and what I call a fatally flawed business model. Because when is it a good idea to take a 911 ambulance out of its coverage area to run a call that has nothing to do with 911? I.e. Uh, non-emergency transport. Correct. And I would argue never. But in the hospital's interest, they're trying to clear that bed. And in, in the... Uh, National EMS, in the ambulance provider's interest, that's where they make their money. But neither one of those things has anything to do with public safety and 911. And we've been offered the contract from the hospital, not the contract, the EMS licenses, which means that if we pick <clears throat> them up on that offer, which I think we should, we could take complete control of the contract. We wouldn't have to run it ourselves, but we could rebid the contract and require anybody that comes in here to run 911 have a separate division where their 911 trucks are dedicated to 911 only. Okay, let's let's back up a little bit. So did... did um before it became a for-profit business, um, were there ever ambulances um, driving non-emergency transport? Yeah, we would do some for when it was hospital-based. Yeah. We would do some, but not near the amount uh, they're doing now. Um, there were other companies that were taking the slack, but we were around maybe back in the day, every cardiac patient that we had, we had to actually take the emory. This is long before uh, they were doing any kind of heart procedures here. So we were doing hospital to hospital transfers, and every blue moon we'd do a back to the nursing home. But typically it was um, 911 calls. And so when National took over, um, and what Sam was saying about the separate divisions, I asked uh, Robbie Atkins, who's one of the family owners, one of the um, owners of the company, about making a separate division, 911 only, not emergency only. And he said they couldn't afford to do that. So that's when I was like, well, maybe you shouldn't be doing it if you can't afford to do it right. Because that's, they were, they would literally use the last ambulance in the county to take a non emergency transport. And this is when you were working for? For National. Okay. Yeah, for How National. How long did you work for National? Three years. Three years. Yeah. Okay. So a quick story on that um, is I talked to Robbie about response times. And, um, it was after one shift one night, and I said, hey, I, want, I asked him about the divided divisions, and he said, we can't afford to do that. And then he went on to say that he treats all patients with equal importance, and he's not going to let a little grandmother wait for transport 
when most 911 calls are for stubbed toes. And when he said that, I just went, I cannot believe this is the guy in charge of providing pre-hospital care for emergencies, and that's his attitude. So, so he said an emergency call is the same? As a nursing home patient going back to the nursing home. He gives them equal importance. And that's when I quit. I was like, well, man, I can't, I can't do this. And their behavior indicates that. Yeah. They will take a 911 truck out of its coverage area to drive to the hospital, go up to the fourth or fifth or third floor, and sometimes maybe sit outside that hospital room for 20 minutes waiting for that patient to get ready to Mm -hmm. be released, which I have witnessed. But but they probably have other um, ambulances. They do, but they just weakened their ability to respond. And if that ambulance isn't in its coverage zone, another ambulance may have to come from further away to an emergency. Um, So... Yeah, there's any number of uh, scenarios that uh, makes that a game of Russian roulette. That's why we hear about response times being 15 and 20 minutes long. Or like Patrick Patrick said, they never showed up. I guess he left the house before. He was tired of waiting. Yeah. Patrick Davin, Commissioner Patrick Davin. Correct, yeah. When he called, he said he just got tired of waiting and put her in the car and, and left. Now that... He lives out off Morton Road, and so the ambulance is stationed in the east side zone. That would be his ambulance, the closest one to him. They may have been who knows where. And so the ambulance that was responding may have been coming from Oconee County, uh, the west side of Athens. You don't know. And there again, there's no transparency, so we can't find where ambulances are responding from. So, so maybe... So, uh, so, so do you guys think that um, nationals... Uh, service is deficient uh are, are they do you think that they're putting people in athens at risk absolutely oh yeah 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 horribly underserved so i mean just for like example you, let's say there's two ambulances in that east side station that could have responded to patrick davenport or any constituent out on that side of town so they bring one of those units in to run somebody home from the hospital who no longer needs uh 911 or no longer needs any kind of acute medical care um, so you say, oh, well, there's another ambulance there in that station, so they're good. But maybe that ambulance now has a, a 911 emergency. Mm-hmm. Their, their zone is empty. Mm-hmm. And it, they can go back and say, oh, well, we were on a 911 call. But what really set up that situation was weakening the whole system by pulling 911 trucks out of it to run non 911 calls. Okay. Um, so, so you're saying that they need they need more ambulances, basically? They need dedicated 911 ambulances. We need to figure out how many ambulances we need to run 911, dedicate those ambulances, and then if they want to continue running the service, set up a separate division that runs the non-emergency transports. If the 911 side gets call saturated, you can pull ambulances up to assist to help out. But you would never pull a, an ambulance out of the 911 system to do non-emergency non 911 calls. Um, do you other communities do it that way? Mm-hmm. Separate divisions. Uh, I know. I know Grady does Grady EMS, which in is a in Atlanta. Um, I know as far as the counties that touch. Uh, Clark County, um, Madison County is 24 7, 365, just ALS ambulances that do nothing but 911. Oglethorpe County, 24 7, 365, advanced life support ambulances that do nothing but 911. Jackson County, the same thing. The only exception to that is Oconee County because they're being run by a national EMS. They, they will use their 911 ambulance system. Every county based ambulance service just does 911 calls. No. Just do Correct. No yeah. No. Now, when I say 911 calls, it, not every call is, is a life and death situation. It could be someone that's sick. It's not life threatening. But we don't do any. I work for a county service now, and it's all just 911 calls, no non emergency transports. And they want to keep us available for the call. I mean, for the for the emergencies, they want us to be available for those because that's what the that's what the citizens expect. And I think most people in Clark County don't have a clue how the system's set up here. Because when we talk to people, they go, "Oh my God, I had no idea it was like that." So um, educating some folks in the in the county or the in the county would be good as far as how the system works. Um, so why do you think that National is doing it that way? 
yeah. to make money. Money, yeah, for profit. Because it's a guaranteed payment, uh, not emergency transport. It's all prearranged, so they're already getting their uh, um, guaranteed revenue from it. Whereas the 911 call may or may not, it and may have insurance, maybe not. So it's more of a to, sure thing. Right. And that 911 truck, just like a fire truck in its fire station, is going to be, you know, the wheels are not going to be turning. They're going to be waiting for the 911 call. They can take that truck and make money off of it. They're going to do it. It's a for-profit public service, which is kind of a oxymoron to me. Of all the public services, I mean, it's fine to privatize some things, but I think EMS should be the very, very last thing to privatize because of the situation we're in now. Putting the, I think they really do put the citizens at risk. And Chris, what, what got me interested in this, uh, or re-interested in, as I was saying, I, I go back to when we were first discussing this, saying that it, it's probably not a good idea, but there was a cardiac arrest downtown, I want to say July of 2016, um, the fire department responded. They, they were able to defibrillate the uh, patient, shock the patient, and they got him back. And I was reading in the paper where, where either a friend or a relative of the patient was saying, you know, yes, it was, it was great. The, the fire department did wonderful. Uh, police department was, was excellent. But it took the ambulance 15 minutes to get there. And, I went, oh my and that was in the paper. That was, in, that the, was in the paper. Yeah. So then, you know, I... Um, I got reinterested and had multiple conversations with multiple police officers, firefighters, uh, public school teachers, who were basically kind of all saying the same thing. And that was, if if, uh, if I ever need an ambulance, throw me in the car, run me in the ambulance, don't call 911. Wait, who, who said that? I'm sorry. Well, I was being told this by, by police officers. <laughs> yeah. By, by <laughs> firefighters. Clark County Police Correct. Correct. And okay. UGA. Was yeah. it more than one police officer? Yes. Yeah. I heard it independent. I was at a bike shop and bumped into an officer that was off duty. I've known him for years. And we we're just kind of chatting along a little bit. And the EMS came up and he said the same thing that if they're ever heard in the line of duty, which would talking to a police officer, you know how bad that could be, obviously. If I'm ever hurt in the line of duty, throw me in the back of the police car and take me to the hospital. Don't wait for the ambulance. And this is coming from the guys that are doing it on the street every day. So they, they, um, and I had one tell me essentially it. the same thing. That the they, same they're thing. not confident that should they be wounded in the line of duty that there would be a timely, uh, emergency medical response. And this particular officer also told me that, uh, police officers were beef, beefing up their trauma kits to treat their own wounds or the wounds of their partner. And, um, that, uh, if, um, so we, we relayed those concerns to Chief Freeman and Mayor Denson, and he said he would look into them, and he did. And when he got back to us, he said, I talked to my officers, and what you are saying uh, is very accurate, and that he would be in contact with the city manager's office. So Bob and I thought, wow, our work here is done. <laughs> you know, there's no way that this is going to go unaddressed, but um, I don't know uh how far that got, whether it ever made it back to the mayor's office or even if it made it to the city manager's office. But um, that's why we are where we are. I mean, we're still trying to make improvements because we keep hearing stories like this. And then, well, um, my wife uh, yeah, got a job working at a Clark County elementary school. Her first day on the job, one of her administrators came to her and said, You know, Miss Raffle, this is a wonderful place to work. We have great kids. Uh, our teachers are awesome, great parental support, um, but this is not the place you want to be if you ever need an ambulance. Just out of the blue. Just out of the blue. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that anything about her relationship to me and my relationship to this issue, and I thought, wow, if a Clark County Elementary School is not the place um, you want to be if you need an ambulance, then where is a good place? Why do you think they said that? Uh, there was a five-year-old boy who was unresponsive, and it took uh, 15 minutes for the ambulance to get there. The fire department got there fairly quick because uh, it is this particular school was near a fire station, which makes a good case for basing your ambulances out of the fire station, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, but they are very limited in what they can do because it's a basic okay, life support response. Yeah, equipment-wise. An advanced life support response. Yeah. And they can't transport. 
Um, how fast should the ambulance? Within eight seconds? minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time. Okay. But, but that's, a, that's a standard? That is a standard. Uh, there's, it's a, it's a, in a couple of standards, one is the CAS, the Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services. They say eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time in an urban setting. And they may have, I believe, 12 minutes and 59 seconds for a rural setting. Uh, and they get that from the NFPA 1710 standard, which is the National Fire Protection Association 1710. And basically what that says is whether your ambulance service is provided by a fire department, um, a not-for-profit hospital, a city government, um, or a for-profit ambulance private service, uh, you should respond in eight minutes and 59 seconds, within eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time. Not an average. As far as that first fire response, that basic response, the BLS response, they said that should be within four minutes. So they have four minutes for BLS. Eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time for ALS, for advanced life support. Though neither one of those standards are legally binding. Um, it is written into their contract, however, mm -hmm. that it be eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time for urban calls, and 12 minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time for rural calls. I checked that before coming. Uh, that was the, the version of the contract that we got. Uh, they may have rewritten it since then. Mm -hmm. We got that through open records request a few years ago to reflect the fact that they're not meeting the standard. Um, they also had to basically take a map of Clark County and with a pen or something, just gerrymander the map <laughs> until they got eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time. And How they called that urban. That? Well, there's, they a, had a, there's a map of Clark County and basically they drew a line. The smallest county in the state, the smallest by the way. county in the state <laughs> of Georgia. They drew a line around the uh, Athens Loop with a few little appendages coming outside the, the loop and said that everything inside this line is urban. And that's where we have to meet eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time, everything outside that loop. And they included a Coney County in this, but anything outside this loop in, in uh, Clark County, we're going to consider non urban. And that gives us 12 minutes and 59 yeah. seconds. Well, the problem is there's no such term that the federal government, Census Bureau, Metropolitan Bureau of Statistics, every statistical analysis I've seen that any, says that anything that's not urban is considered rural. Non-urban is not a, a term. So when they report their data to the state and the federal government, they every square inch of athens Clark County is urban. So the only way they meet their standard is by gerrymandering a map, which in a way that makes no sense, uh, to justify their response times or to, to meet the standard, which is another way of saying we don't meet the standard. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, um, but the hospitals have expressed that they have full confidence in, in National, and they, um, Dee Burkhead um, from Piedmont Athens Regional said at the work session the other day um, that, that National's response times were superior. Um, Based on... Well, according to that map, yeah. But what it's we're saying outside the loop, you should still have 859 as your criteria. But, but they're anyway, making it. The hospitals are, are supporting um, national ambulance service. I, I guess, why do you think that they're supporting them? If, if what you're saying is true. It sounded like to me after the work session is that they, they like having them there, their beck and call to come in and move patients out. Like they need them for that service. And the 911 stuff is just kind of like a secondary concern. That's what the impression I got from but, but when Dee was like talking like, about. Like public safety is a secondary concern. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But why? Why would a hospital? They evidently, yeah. they evidently, with their business model, they need to get patients moved out so they can fill that bed with another patient. So moving the patients out seems to be their priority. That's why they were like, they gave national kind of first dibs on on taking the non-emergency transports out of the hospital. And yeah. so they're there to as a service to them. Yeah, I don't I don't know that many people on the EMS Oversight Committee has ever seen the raw data. I don't know if Dee Burkett's ever seen the raw data. Um, we've seen the raw data, and it's terrible. We had to do an open records request from the state of Georgia. As a matter of fact, we had to ask for over five years 
to look at the raw data. And that's the only way you're going to know mm -hmm. if the response times are adequate or not. You can't just say we're great because we say we're great and not provide any proof or not provide access to the raw data. So five years ago, we started asking for the raw data. And they said, you know, our numbers are great, but you can't see the data. And then well, so did four, Andy and four years Jared. ago, they said, our numbers are still great, but you still can't see the data. And three years ago, they said that our response times are wonderful, but you can't see the data. And then a couple years ago, they started saying response times don't matter. Yeah, that was a good one. But our response times are really good, and you can't see our data. <laughs> and then for 15 months, Andy Herod and Jerry Neesmith, mm -hmm. two of our commissioners, asked for the data. They were denied. Yeah. We were told by our own city attorney that we could not have any access to that data because they're a private company and they can do what they want. But that was simply not true. So Bob and I hired an, an attorney and... Um, Basically, May it took us seven months still at that point. Mm -hmm. We made an open records request. We got the raw data, and it was horrifying. It yeah, it was. was. Way worse than I thought it was going to be. And these are all in a column that says from the Department of Public Health, 911 emergency response. And what we found is that out of about 50,000 calls between 2014 and 2017, that 31,055 of them exceeded the standard. So their response 31, was 31,055 911 yeah. 31, emergency responses out of 50,000 over, 50, over four years, four years exceeded the response time standard. So what their response to that was, was, oh, okay, our response times suck, but response times don't matter. All of these were priority two calls, but without any proof. Which means that they're not running license sirens, sirens as a priority too. Yeah. Then, then they said that the thing about response times don't matter. They came up with this theory of you look at patient outcome to measure whether or not the response was appropriate or some kind of goofy thing that was totally immeasurable. Well, it would be impossible to track. track it yeah. would be very easy to, to, to cherry pick. Yeah. But um, that was just like a smoke screen of covering up their crappy response times. I, I mean, so, do, do response times matter? Like, what? what yes, you know? they do, Chris. <laughs> if you're hit by a car on your bicycle, you want someone there much sooner than later. And that's, I'd like to. But yeah, I think as a medic for over 40 years, response times matter incredibly. Yeah, and, it, and heart attacks, strokes, accidents. Suicides, childbirth, neonatal emergencies. I mean, we were, we were in the whole gamut of every imaginable uh, medical thing that could happen to someone. Right. Medical and trauma. A few minutes, one way or the other. Could, could yeah, sure. Life. Oh, yeah. Not every call, obviously, but yeah. maybe, you know, what if it's 5%? Yeah. And what's 5% of 31,055? It's a big number. It's a lot of human beings, a lot of families impacted. And just going back to that number, what they basically said is that we deprioritize a lot of calls from lights and siren response to no lights and siren response. Well, any service is going to do that. So I said, okay, well, tell us your criteria because it feels to me that you're over downgrading but the calls. So you think it's legitimate to just to oh yeah, there are times sometimes when you would do sure that. yeah you want you would want to be very careful because any medic who any EMT or paramedic who's worked in the, the uh, in the business very long we'll know that there are times where calls come in and it sounds like it's not going to be anything not much to it and you get there and it's horrible uh, mm -hmm. very critical patient uh, there are other times where it comes in sounding very critical and you get there and it's and it's not much of anything so you really don't know until you get there so you have to be very very careful downgrading calls very careful and there is a protocol out there called emergency medical dispatching, which runs through a series of questions where you, where you eventually get to whether it's down. Which is what we're hoping for. And so, <clears throat> so anyway, so they're saying that, oh, those were all just priority two calls, but offering no proof that they were in fact priority two calls. Sorry yeah, 31, 30, <laughs> yeah, 31,055 calls out of about 50,000 calls. And, um, Basically, they were just wanting uh, to just dismiss that, saying that they were priority two um, and maybe something that response times don't matter. And uh, 
they've never accounted for a single one of those calls. And accountability, I think, is key. And we need access to the raw data to know if they're doing a good job or not. I still don't understand why the hospital would be trying to defend National. Like, if National's not well, doing a good job, why wouldn't they just get another company to do it? That's a great question. And I think that the... Uh, I don't know that the hospitals know that they're not doing a great job. I think that maybe D. Bur Burkett has some idea, um, but I don't even know that the rest of the oversight committee ever talks about this kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to go sitting, to the meetings. We don't Bob know what I happens. I met with, uh, with Commissioner Davenport, I think, after the May commission meeting, and I just asked him straight up. I said, Patrick, I said, um, if your phone rings right now and it's your mom calling you, telling you that your dad is having a heart attack are you going to tell her to call 911 and he said hell no i'm going to tell <laughs> her to throw him in the car and drive him to the hospital and i thought oh my god we have a serious problem that's exactly what the police officers have told us mm -hmm. firefighters public school teachers and um if you have a commissioner feeling like that then there's a problem and it's not just Patrick. He's talking about some of his other constituents where they called 911 and they just didn't, the ambulance never showed up. They gave up, threw their loved one in the car and drove to the hospital. That's what the 31,055 calls or uh, delayed EMS responses are about. Is that what that is? That's what this is, where every every page I That's think a person. Is, is, a, is 36 families, 36 calls, and I think there's like eight or 900 pages of it. Um, when we were doing HB 264, House Bill 264, to try to get more transparency in, in EMS statewide. That's bill going through the state legislature. It went through the state legislature. It cleared it's the House. Uh, it's about EMS. House Bill transparency. 264, transparency and oversight. And uh, it was 148 to 6 in the House in favor of the bill, 51 to nothing in favor of the bill in the Senate, although it had some changes to it. So, uh, so it passed. It uh, was never brought to a vote. 199 representatives voted for some version of this bill, and only six voted against it. And um, Jeff Mullis, who was over the, uh, I believe, the Rules Committee, was able to effectively poison it, I heard, by putting something in there that nobody could vote for. And uh, it's called poisoning a bill. And it may be a coincidence, it may not, but uh, the, the ambulance company Priority EMS that owns National also just bought the uh, ambulance service in uh, Rep. Senator Mullis's district. So I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but I'll let you have your own opinion. I've seen. <laughs> but, but there is, a, going back to National in Athens and Oconee, um, there is an oversight committee. Um, right. So why haven't they been raising the alarm bells? If, if the data is think, as bad as you're saying. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they've ever seen the raw data, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I don't know that they – if somebody calls National EMS to say that they have had a problem, then uh, Huey or Robbie or one of the Atkinses is going to tell them, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, we had you know this 911 unit. Uh, was running a wreck, and there was another 911 unit on this uh, chest pain call. We had another 911 unit at the nursing home with difficulty breathing, and so, we're so sorry. And they're not going to say anything about where their other nine trucks were, several of which could have been on non-emergency 9911 transports, and they're probably never going to say anything to the Oversight Committee about that. And I think we got verification of that. Uh, at the meeting when, when Mr. Burkett said that they don't they don't look at calls and haven't looked at them for almost five years. But this is the oversight. Committee. This is the oversight. This is the oversight committee. Is that it their job to, to look into this kind of stuff. It's the one that Sam went to and got pretty much berated out of there. They're not open to the public. You can't go as a concerned citizen and sit the, in. The last time I went, to, I was I've been invited to to two, and. Um, it was interesting because you had you know the, so, several people there from the different hospitals and maybe some other entities, but there were the largest contingent of people there were uh, were from National EMS. They were from the executive uh, 
so they their ownership own. of, of uh, national EMS. And they were very clearly functioning as members of the committee. Um, and the, the second time I was there, I was asking for a survey of our police officers just to see what their feeling is about, um, about response times like that. You know, I'd already heard from Chief Freeman. And, but anyway, and um, so I was making a little bit of progress there, and it was just shouted down by the, the members of National EMS, and, and it just never, you know, had any traction after that at all. And the last time I went, Justin Johnson, the assistant city manager, asked me to go with him. And Mayor Denson had told uh-huh. Bob and I that we should go to these meetings. So, um, so I did. They had moved the meeting, so I ended up getting there late. Uh, they moved both place and time of the meeting, but Justin, Mr. Johnson texted me and, and told me where he was. And, and when I got, I walked in the room, I, I, they were looking at me like, uh, like I had just done something wrong. And when I sat down, they were like, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm, I'm here to attend the oversight committee meeting. He said, well, these meetings are not open to the public. And I said, well, that's not what I was told. And Mr. Burkett said, well, who told you that? I said, Mayor Denson. And he said, well, she's mistaken. And I said, well, okay. And they said, well, you can say your piece and leave. And um, again, I just wonder about the legality of having um, public safety meetings that are closed to the public. And emergency medical services are a public safety. Plus they're being subsidized safety. by the county. Yeah. And they when, get money. When we went to Atlanta to meet with the uh, chairman uh, of the... Uh, Industry and Labor Commission for the House and the Senate Ethics Commission for the uh, for the Senate, of course, and several people from DPH. There were three attorneys in the room, and I described DPH's. the part Georgia Department of Public Health. So we were meeting with them about getting the kind of raw data about response time and the nature of those calls uh, to become public information. That was the purpose of that meeting. And I brought up the issue of the oversight committee meetings in our local community being closed to the public. And even though there were three pretty high-powered Georgia Department of Public Health attorneys in the room, none of them knew if that was legal. They could not say if, if withholding, keeping the public barred from those meetings was legal. And they just basically referred us to the attorney general. So we, we haven't gotten a meeting with him yet, but we are trying. And our goal is to have him look into that and see if, in fact, it is legal. I don't think it will be. Uh, if for some reason it meets some loophole of the law, that's something HB 264 might need to look at in 2020. But even if it's legal, it's not ethical and it's not right. and It needs to stop. Uh, private public safety needs more transparency, mm-hmm. in my opinion. That's the whole less. thing. So, so on the subject of the oversight committee meetings, mention the time that you asked about protecting your family. Right. So I was um, I was at a, an oversight committee meeting, and there were the, the four members of National EMS of the of the maybe nine people at the table. So. They had. They were more represented than any than either hospital, and they were very clearly functioning as members of the committee. Uh, I asked the owner of, of National EMS. I said, it, you know, if my son or a member of my family has a time sensitive, life threatening emergency, can you assure me that the ambulance designated to cover my area will not have been pulled to run a non emergency nine nine one one transport? And he said, No, I will not. I said, well, sir, that's a, that's a serious problem. And I think it's about time that we start asking that same question of our mayor and commission because at the, la- at the work session, the hospitals pretty much said that if you, if athens Clark County wants the zone licenses, the ambulance license for your county, you may have them. And there was some misconception at that meeting that if we took control of the licenses, we would have to run it ourselves. And I'm not saying that that's not a great idea. I actually think it is. Yeah. You mean, you mean make it through, through the fire department? County service. Make it a public service through the through the fire department. Matter of fact, uh, Mr. Williams, city manager, has already done a study saying it would cost us four and a half million dollars to do that. That study didn't include any revenues that EMS might bring in, which, which it might does. be about forty to fifty percent of that mm-hmm. total cost. Plus, the more people who get health insurance in Georgia, the 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 less it will cost. The, the city if they decide to do that. But the bottom line is we were offered the zone contracts and we should take them up on yeah. that because if we get the zone contracts, we can run it ourselves. 
We can stay with national and rewrite the contract so that it preserves public safety, or we could rebid the contract and go with another company that may have separate divisions. So um, it would just give us control of the contract, it would give us transparency, it would give us accountability, and I think it would be a tremendous service to the community. And I was ac- actually pretty, uh, pretty surprised to hear him mm-hmm. say that. And that, As was I about moving dispatch to ACC to them handle all medical instead of transferring it to so to how national. Does it work now, first it explain that. Well, you call nine one one. You have an emergency. Your baby is not breathing. Your whoever's having a heart attack. Athens Clark County picks up the phone. What's your emergency? You give your description. They say, "Hang on a minute." And then you hear a down beep, you know, beep, 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 and then National will the pick phone, up. You hear the phone ring. Ringing, yeah. So it's like this huge delay, and you're like, well, someone's like critically injured or sick, and you have to repeat your subject or repeat so you your call complaint. Call nine one one, and you get transferred. You get transferred. You call nine one one. You explain your emergency, and then you're put on hold. And you're patched over, and the phone rings. You actually can hear it ringing. And yeah. the national EMS will pick up and say, what's your emergency? If the call gets dropped, which it can happen, d- does, you have to call back 911, explain your emergency, put on hold, and you call back. And the, one of the, the tapes that we got, 911 tapes that we got through an open records request of a dying baby, uh, that's exactly what did happen. Mm-hmm. That's horrible. So, um, it's it's not efficient. It's confusing. Uh, when when Patrick Davenport had that situation with his mom, where he called nine one one and was put on hold, he thought he had made a mistake. Yeah. Especially when when the ambulance never came, he thought he had done something wrong. When in fact he had just called nine one one. So um, so the moving dispatch to have an ACC ACC handle all of it. That'll create a lot more efficiency because you're just talking to one person. If they certify them as emergency medical dispatchers, they can go through protocols to tell the person on the phone, this is what you should do in the meantime, and they stay with them. And it'll create transparency of the uh, response time data because ACC will be keeping up with it. And that will provide accountability. Why was your ambulance? Why did you not have any ambulances here where you should have? And so that would just be tremendous amount of benefit to uh, improving the system. And I, I was a little bit confused about, you know, Dee Burkett um, in his presentation at the work session on July 9th said that the, they're, they currently, uh, that National EMS is currently using emergency medical dispatching. Well, that is simply not true unless they started like last week or something, which I don't yeah. think. But in the, the, the dying baby uh, episode, uh, this father called 911. And they were just coming into. It eventually went. It all initially went to Madison County, but they were actually coming into Clark County on 72. So it got patched over to um, Clark County 911. And he had to tell his emergency, be put on hold, patched over to National EMS, where he had to retell his emergency. The call dropped. The call dropped. It's horrible. It has to he call had to back. Call back. Same thing. But He's the driving. Line is. They never took the phone out of the driver's hands. The call took four minutes. They never dispatched police, fire, or EMS. They, um, and they never, I mean, the first thing the, the dispatcher should have done with any training would have been to, to ask the phone to be put on speaker and to be handed back to the person in the back seat doing um, CPR and rescue breathing and, you know, just kind of coaching them through that. So there That's, was someone in the back seat? There was someone the in the mom, yeah. doing CPR and rescue breathing on a six week old baby that was never offered an ambulance, never offered a fire or, or police response. Just basically told to keep driving. Just keep driving. And, and the guy went, I'm going to get there as fast no as I can. No instructions and just hung up. Yeah. Uh, June 2nd of this year, 2019, my, my wife and I and, and my whole family went to a, a concert at the athens Clark County Library. And um, about 40 minutes into the performance, one of the musicians who was seated became unresponsive quit playing, became unresponsive, and then ha- every skeletal muscle in his body contracted, where he had an internal defibrillator that had shocked him. In other words, he had an internal defibrillator that recognized a life-threatening arrhythmia, and uh, he was shocked. My wife called 911, told her emergency, was put on hold, 
transferred. transferred to National, where she told the dispatcher, we have an elderly male who's having some sort of cardiac event, who's been defibrillated, and all he did was take where she was, confirm which room it was, and hung up. No instructions, so no they're staying not, they're with not, them. Um, obeying the protocol that they're supposed to. Well, I don't think they're supposed to. I don't think they've they've ever done it. They probably don't have. They don't have. I don't know why Mr. Burkett was saying that. It's simply not true. But to make matters, but they should be doing. Oh yeah, absolutely. And 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 in the in the proposal that the Athens Clark County Police Department has put out there, which is option three, it has Athens Clark County taking over all nine one one dispatching to include medical and to train their dispatchers in emergency medical dispatching. Mm -hmm. Stay with that caller who has a critical event or a life-threatening emergency, and you coach them through it, and you assist them. And um, there's been a lot of lives saved. Mm -hmm. It's a great system. They are not doing it. And the fact that he said that, and it's simply not true, I just just don't understand that. But this particular call, the um, the unit response, Bonding. They got there in maybe eight or nine minutes. So that we were right across the street from the hospital. So that, that wasn't the issue. But they came in without a cardiac monitor, without a jump box, without a stretcher, and basically without ever monitoring the patient, they had him stand up, walk down steps, and walk to the stretcher. Everybody in the room was shocked. And I don't know whether that it was a basic life support unit and they couldn't mm-hmm. do cardiac monitoring or what was going on, but I'm going to try to find out. That happens but, a lot um, now, too. They'll send an ambulance with just two EMTs, not paramedic. So, But they'll send them to cardiac events, like the young man that was shot in the chest on the east side last summer got a basic EMT ambulance responding to him, which is horribly underserved because, yeah, they can do a lot, but they can't do everything a paramedic can. So, so it makes a huge so difference. So Mm-hmm. needed advanced life support and he needed it right away yeah and he didn't get either and they they justify it by saying that well the basic life support truck was the closest unit and what i say is it shouldn't have been a basic life support truck that truck should have been an advanced life support truck if madison county and oglethorpe county and jackson county yeah everybody were to do nothing but als because that's the right way to do it then that's that's what we need to be doing so he basically died without ever receiving advanced life support in the field. And that's that's inexcusable. He died. He did die. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He died in route. So, And the baby died eventually because they got... The other tape, that yeah. was November of 2017. Yeah, the baby was transferred to regional and evidently was viable enough to be flown to either Eggleston or Scottish Rite in Atlanta where it, it died later. So that tells me earlier intervention may have been... May have May have saved him. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know, and yeah. that's that's very problematic. We don't know. You but can't the, tell that family that you did everything that, right. that could have possibly been done for him because it wasn't. It's a horrible tape. But the guy goes, I'm just going to drive as fast as I can. This was like on a Monday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, going through the streets of Athens, trying to get to the hospital. From the furthest part yeah. of the Madison County. So that's an example of the system we have now. And that needs to be changed. And the change will, like I said before, will increase the efficiency, transparency, and the accountability of the whole system. Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, um, whether we can prove to people, I mean, I think re- a reasonable person would say that this is unacceptable and that you need to account for these calls. Um, and I think then you would see even more how unacceptable it is. But what we're asking for is just very reasonable. We want athens Clark County, our state-of-the-art 911 center, to take over all 911 calls, including medical. We want our first fire response. So when the fire department responds, and they're, they're doing a much better job of that mm-hmm. now than they have in the past. But And, and they're responding with, with basic life support EMTs. That's great. It's a good first step. As a matter of fact, it is the first step towards what we're going to ask, which is that they upgrade their first fire department response to advanced life support. Paramedic level. Paramedic level. What that does is bring advanced medicines and advanced procedures to the patient quicker. They can get more medications, more treatments. It's just a better... And skill set. Right. And we, you asked this question, we never really answered it about do response times matter. But uh, Bob and I were meeting with uh, Dodd Farrell 
who's the mayor of Winterville, whose police officers, firefighters, first responders, citizens, school, t- school personnel has told them the same thing, that response times are terrible. Um, so we were, it was me, Justin Johnson, who's the assistant city manager, Bob, and Mr. Farrell. We were talking to um, Chief Scarborough on the phone, uh, doing a phone conference. He couldn't make it for whatever reason. And I said, Chief Scarborough, I said, does the Oversight Committee and National EMS care about response times? And his response was verbatim, no, they do not. And I said, again, okay, well, that's a problem. So you ask me, do response times matter? And I say that very much so. And I've put this, I've got a, a website now where I have this broken down response times matter, uh, medical response times matter, trauma. And even according to the local hospitals, uh, response times matter. Um, but basically, you know, I could just go on and on and you can stop me when you want. But time lost is brain loss in a stroke. Mm-hmm. Uh, the journal Stroke has basically quantified that. 1.9 million neurons per minute die when treatment is delayed. And so the difference between a seven minute response and a 17 minute response, let's say, which is what we're kind of, we see a lot of 17 minute responses here. We say they need to be seven, not 17, is 20 million neurons. And every minute after that is another one point million neurons. So uh, time loss is brain loss, and that's according to the journal Stroke. Um, the uh, as the far cardiac. as heart attacks, yeah. the, the, the saying from Johns Hopkins University for innovative me- medicine is when uh, time is muscle, and every little bit counts. Every little bit of time counts, and every little bit of muscle counts. And in the hospital, they will fight for 15 seconds. They will fight for a minute. They will spend a lot of money to get patients from the door to balloon or to definitive treatment for mm-hmm. some heart attacks. But they're not fighting nearly as hard to get that patient from the floor. From their in, house. From, from their the house scene. to the door. But they're equally as important. Time is time, and a minute is a minute, and cardiac muscle damage. And who would think damage. that response times don't matter? It's just a, it's just a ridiculous concept. I think it comes from the private ambulance services because it allows them to make more money. Yeah, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Um, so, who do you think benefits from this? Uh, like, like, does the hospital? Yes. Benefit from this? They How? get patients out of the hospital uh, more quickly, more efficiently. And national benefits but from can't it. Can't they do that with another service? Like they could, but for some reason, I guess they're seeing this as more efficient. I think personally that they've made a mistake and somebody's covering it up. That's how it feels to me. I don't think the whole oversight committee is aware of just how bad it is. And part of our job going forward is to meet with the hospital authority, to meet with the hospital boards, to try to meet with the hospital administrators who so far have refused to meet with us. Mm-hmm. But try. to meet with these organizations and let them know what we know. There, I, I, I honestly believe that most of the oversight committee does not know how bad it is. But again, when, when Patrick Davenport said what he said at the work session, basically that he's not calling 911 and he's telling his constituents not to call 911. What else do you need to hear? <laughs> yeah, what else do you need to hear? What else do you need to hear other than that Chief Freeman, the police chief, had talked to his police officers, and yes, they do not feel comfortable should they be wounded in the line of duty that they're going to get a timely medical response. I keep thinking that our job is done because we've taken this, but... I felt like the meeting uh, Tuesday, July 9th, when Patrick said that, I felt like the meeting should have just stopped and people say, wait a second, we can't go on until we fix this. This is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, So Dee Burkett said um, at the meeting, um, um, I just lost my track, I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, he said that we could have the zone contracts is one. And that's that's huge. So so let's just go back to what's not controversial, in my opinion. The Athens 911 State-of-the-Art Communication Center taking over all 911 dispatching. Absolutely no reason to do it. Police department supports it. We support it. A4E supports it. Uh, It makes tremendous amount of sense. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost a little bit of money, but I think the commission is on board for that is what I heard. Uh, I think I heard Mike Hamby say, if I'm having difficulty breathing, I don't want to have to explain my my Mm -hmm. medicine twice. It's like, I remember my train of thought. Okay, so yeah, Deeper said at the meeting that before the switch over to the private service that the hospitals were losing, what was it, one and a half million dollars? No, no, they said they were each losing exactly one million million dollars. A million each. Andy Herod asked for an audit and was 
denied. But, I mean, do you think, um, I, I guess, do you think that's true? And, no. And, no, okay, no. I don't. I, I mean, I had, I, I mean, I wanted somebody to find out. There was a nurse who was um, basically would occasionally uh, ride in the ambulance on certain maybe transfers between hospitals or something. And her entire uh, salary was billed to EMS. I mean, I mean, little things like that. Also, and here's another thing. I mean, accounting, you know, Mark Twain said that there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. Well, we got statistics, and I'm afraid that the, the people who are controlling the data don't want you to see what's under underneath those statistics. But um, if, if the ambulance runs a call and they don't transport the patient, they might write that off as a $600 loss. But it didn't cost them $600 to run that call. Mm-hmm. The medics were already being paid. They were already there. Basically, you're looking at fuel and wear and tear on the vehicle. So did they write that as a $600 loss or a $60 loss? My guess is a $600 loss. And the same thing to justify the $100,000 subsidy from athens Clark County. It's because the 911 is, quote, unquote, not making money. But we don't know. Because we don't get to see those figures. And I think they're inflated because they of the way it's reported. And there's an accounting procedure that, that will take that into account. Um, and I think if the county ever gets control of the, the contracts, then we should ask to, to do that and see that, to see the actual loss. So the, the $100,000 subsidy from the taxpayers of athens Clark County is subsidizing 911 because they say they're not making money on 911. Yet the, the whole system is making a tremendous amount of money. As a matter of fact, Priority EMS is the fastest growing ambulance c- company in the country. So athens Clark County citizens are subsidizing 911 trucks, and then they're using those same trucks to make money again in the other area of non-911, non-emergency transports. So I don't see how that's... Um, legal it may be but i don't see how that it's ethical and it mm-hmm. certainly puts the community at risk um i do think that would put the community at risk but what um let's see so if it was true that they were losing all this money and maybe it's just something due to the way athens is uh we have a lot of uh you know people in poverty here. Mm-hmm. maybe maybe there is a non-one-one abuse of mm-hmm. uh, all those oh, yeah. all those things are true there okay, is, so, so yeah. Maybe that would contribute to them losing money. And and absolutely. Okay, and so, so I, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that maybe this is how, how they're benefiting. From Perhaps the current it could be another way, um, and, and and it may, as far as for what we're asking, it may be a moot point. But basically, in in all of this data, I can't trust what I can't verify. I just can't. Plus, to me, a public service should not be interested in making, I mean, how much money does the fire department make? Not much. Or the police department. They write tickets. And so, like, a public service is not there to generate money. It's there to protect the citizens. And the ambulance EMS is the same difference. And we have those figures. Uh, Deber, no, I'm sorry. Um, Blaine Williams uh, came up with those figures, and it was four and a half million dollars to run it ourselves. Uh, but again, I'm pretty sure that didn't account for the revenue it would bring in, which would mm-hmm. probably be somewhere around forty percent, with a with an uptick as more people in the state of Georgia are going to have access to health insurance. Not as many as we would like, but every time. Uh, more Georgians are covered by health insurance or expand, more opinions, then that number, that four and a half million dollars will go down. I think it's probably somewhere around two and a half, to be honest, right now, but I'd have to talk to Blaine Let's about that. Let's say it's that. four and a half million yeah. dollars. Is that a year per year? That's my understanding, and that may be, a lot of that may be the initial cost, too, of setting it up, or it may be For equipment. operating. Yeah, stuff. we don't know the I, specifics. I don't know. We'd have to sit down and talk to uh, Blaine about that, but um, do you think that the people of Athens uh, would be okay with the extra taxes that it would take to, in order to well ha- have to do it right and, and separate divisions like like this? If it really is for enough, well, to, uh, to separate divisions, I think D said it would only cost a million dollars, didn't he, Mister Briquette? 
I think he said 1.5. Uh, maybe is what maybe I'm 1.5 to separate divisions. Again, that's their number, and right. I would want some pure, clean accounting to, to either verify that. And again, I don't think that figure. considers revenue. They're always coming up with uh, these numbers that are. Yeah, I, I don't. So I, we don't know. We, we don't know, and, and we don't have access. So. Again, a public service is. Yeah, it's expensive. I mean, fire trucks are expensive. But, the stations are expensive. But we already have the nine fire stations, so I don't think yeah. the, stations are, are, the stations are already built. We can house ambulances in our nine fire stations, and we should, whether it's national or somebody else. Mm-hmm. I've been saying that for, for eight, ten years. But to answer your question, I do think they would. And first of all, again, I don't think it's four and a half. I think it's closer to half that or, or 60% of that. Um, they're splossed. That may have come and gone, but in the in the long run, there may be splossed if we could ever get that as a priority on there. There's grants. There's lots of grants mm-hmm. out there. Trauma and grants. That, again, that's a, a Chief Scarborough uh, question, but I think he'd be the first one to tell you that there are a lot of grants out there uh, that could help mitigate that cost. And there's also maybe some creative ways to, to go at it. Like uh, I know there's already a 911 fee on your, on your phone bill. Maybe we could you know, go bring that from a dollar ninety nine to two ninety nine or something. So there, there are different ways to look at revenue, but I think they would support it. Yeah, it's public safety. I mean, that's the that's the big one. You know. You know, the one thing that we we come up against a lot of times, Chris, is that uh, people don't like to think about an ambulance until they need one. And then, unfortunately, it could be too late. If that ambulance that your family is relying on um, is somewhere else doing something that doesn't have to anything to do with 911, then, then that's a serious problem. But, but people typically don't like to think about an ambulance until they need one. And again, by then it might be too late. Most people that we talk about don't even know that yeah, they, they don't. privatized EMS. Yeah, they don't have a clue. So, they think it's all county based. You call nine one one, you get a fire yeah. truck and an ambulance from the county, and away and, you go. And that's why I just, you know, I think if we can keep it simple and keep it, it is a complicated issue. But what we're asking, I think, again, is fairly uncontroversial, which is uh, public dispatching instead of privatized nine one one. Uh, we're asking to keep going with the Athens Clark County Fire Department. We're getting them all to the EMT level. Keep going. Get that. Uh, those advanced procedures and medicines closer to your patients. We're asking for data to be available to stakeholders, citizens, mayor and commission, others, uh, people who might be looking at this area to move into. That's something David Block, one of the uh, the, the retired neurologist that's been working with us is, is looking at. We think oversight committee meetings should be open to the public. They're, they're public safety meetings. Mm-hmm. We think they should be open to the public. That's neither um, rocket science nor is it uh, an extreme request. To me, uh, public safety, uh, privatized public safety needs more transparency rather than less. And what we have now is something close to zero transparency. Even the the commissioners who just recently have been made members of the Oversight Committee have to sign non-disclosure agreements, which again, borderline legal. Our Department of Public Health attorneys, there were three in the room, we asked them about that also. They're like, "Eh, I don't know if that's legal. Hmm. And that was another one they punted to the attorney general. We're going to try to get a meeting with him. And we're just simply asking that they stop vacating zones to run out emergency 9911 transports. Stop abandoning state-mandated 911 coverage zones to run calls that don't have anything to do with 911. And, yes, it does have everything to do with them making more money and the hospitals getting their their beds cleared faster. But we think there are better ways to do Mm -hmm. that. Okay, that's all I have. But is, do you have uh, any, any, other, any closing comments? Um, I think just that. I mean, in terms of the work session, um, I think we need to expedite. And I, I'm echoing uh, Commissioner Neesmith and Commissioner Hamby here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm echoing and, and agreeing with them that we need to expedite the implementation of the undiluted recommendation of the athens Clark County mm-hmm. uh, Police Department to take over all 911 dispatching. And by undiluted, I mean that doesn't mean moving national EMS into our communication center. Where It means us taking over, doing it, yeah. doing it ourselves, making it a public system as it should be. 
And that's option three. And to answer, uh, I don't know why they didn't answer Mr. Uh, Commissioner Hamby. He asked several times about when did this timetable start. Well, the recommendation yeah. made w- was made in August of 2017. Two years ago. Which is almost two years ago. And I, again, I don't know how that was kept quiet, but uh, we just learned about it, thanks to Mayor Gertz, so I thank him for that. Uh, we think athens Clark County should take over the EMS licenses that were offered to us by uh, Mr. Burkett, and I think uh, St. Mary's, the St. Mary's mm-hmm. person, agreed. And um, so maybe they maybe they aren't as happy as, as we think. I don't know. But I was surprised to hear that. We should take them up on that yesterday or the soon as possible opportunity. Again, it doesn't obligate us to run 911. It just gives us control of the contract saying you can pick who you want. You can pick how you want and write the contract. You can rebid it or you can do it yourself. Do most counties own their own EMS? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. When, Madison, over when I mentioned to um, Senator uh, Kirkpatrick that we didn't have the li- the zone licenses here in Athens and that the hospitals had tell, it. the commissioners had an asked for them, she was absolutely shocked. She couldn't believe that we wouldn't want our own zone contracts to, uh, to, to... I think part of the trouble, too, has been that St. Mary's started their EMS in 69, so 50 years ago. And regional, then AGH, Athens General, got there shortly thereafter to compete. And I think the fact that both hospitals have been providing this service essentially for free for the last, you know, 45 years or however long. And then the subsidy, of course, cost a little bit. But I think the county just isn't used to having to pay for this. They've been like spoiled all these years by someone else providing the service. And now I think it's time for them to step up and really do it right. Well, they need to really step up. There's a classic economic term that there, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Mm-hmm. Well, our free lunch is, is Commissioner Davenport saying, hell no, I'm not calling that yeah. one. I'm going to throw her in, tell her to throw him in the car and run him to the hospital. Our free lunch is, is our police officers telling our, our police chief that they don't feel secure that should they be injured in the line of duty, that they're going to receive a timely medical response. Our um, free lunch is, is John Cooper having to, uh, over a period of, of maybe a year and a half, calling nine times and never getting a timely response for his critically ill son. And there were times where it just took so long where they ended up having to intubate his child, whereas if they had been there earlier, they, it may not have gotten that far. So there are we are paying for this service um, in, th- in other ways. I think the takeaway I got from watching, I wasn't there at the meeting, but I watched it. And I think if you have a commissioner that experienced what Patrick did, and if that doesn't, give the motivation or whatever to make major changes, I think something's de- desperately wrong. Because he s- stood there and said he called and he got so, he waited so long he drove him in. Now that seems like that should be enough to get people's attention to do something. I mean, that just kind of blew me away that he said that. And people were like, oh, well, that's probably just a one-time deal or whatever. Whatever reaction they had, to me, it wasn't enough. They were calling them outliers. Outliers, They're not yeah. outliers. They're part of this stack. They're, yeah. the, they're up here because this is 2014 to 2017, and now we're like 2018 and 2019. It's They're in here, and we need to account. As far as I know, not a single one of these calls has been accounted for. So anyway, we just want more transparency and accountability, and I think the best way to do that is to take – uh, listen to your police department, take over 911, mm-hmm. and um, get some transparency in those meetings, and take control of those licenses if they're given to you. That's, that's uh, easy. That'd be stuff. huge. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, having us. Appreciate it. Absolutely.